Welcome to Releasing Your Inner Dragon, where story creators talk story creation. Drake is an award-winning fantasy novelist and creative writing teacher. You can find his epic fantasy series, The Genesis Oblivion, on Kindle Vela. Marie runs a fantasy world-building channel called Just In Time World, and her first book, The Hidden Blade, is available on Kindle Unlimited. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to Releasing Your Inner Dragon. Today we're going to talk about family relationships, including the romantic relationship that forms a new family, and how to write them and how to use them in your fantasy novels. It's going to be a lot of fun. So one of my iconic formation families that I always turn to when I think of like family life to strive for is the Adams family with Morticia and Gomez. Seriously, they, that's marriage goals. Being as connected and as supportive as Morticia and Gomez is absolutely marriage goals. I always think of that play where the kids are spraying blood on each other and on the audience members and and everyone is shocked and everybody's horrified. Everybody's shocked and horrified. And there at the back is their family standing on their feet, like, you know, <laughs> and the applause. They are so supportive of each other. They, they are so there for each other. It's such a together family. It's amazing. And a lot of stories from that time period. You know, I before we started this podcast, we were talking, I said, oh yeah, just like the monsters. And you had never even heard of the monsters. I'd never heard of them. Yeah. Um, it's another, you know, kind of it's the same vein. And I can't remember, I think the monsters came out before the yeah, answer. So if I, I we should have looked it up probably, but uh, I'm just gonna go with that because I remember the monsters being all black and white. And I mm-hmm. kind of remember Adam's family being in color, even though they use nothing but blacks and whites on set or whatever. So the monsters was you had Frankenstein was the dad, the the bride of Frankenstein was still his wife, but they had uh, grandpa was a vampire living in the basement, their child, they had a son, about a 10, 12 year old son that was a, um, a vampire, but then they had this absolutely normal human blonde headed chick as their daughter and it was their natural daughter. They had, a, they had spot. It's just that spot was a dragon who lived under the stairs. It literally, they were living in 1950s America. So they had a car, you know, the, the children went to school. The, it literally was just exactly like the Adams family as far as that. But mm-hmm. again, that family had that relationship. They supported each other. They, they, it was just fantastic. And it was fantastic to see that stuff. And again, going back to the last podcast, I do believe entertainment is a form of fantasy fulfillment because a lot of the shows were like that. Look at, you know, we talked about um, Leave it to Beaver. Yeah. Leave it to Beaver is something that maybe, you know, today's modern woman might get really pissed off about when you just go, oh, wait, it's a show about a woman who stays at home and has no career and who's expected to have dinner on the table and a man who goes out and earns all the money and she's just at home taking care of the kids. Yes, on the surface, that's exactly what it is. But their relationship was always that of equals there. You know, she was absolutely just as important as he was at all times. And most of the shows were like that. I mean, I love Lucy and, and the honeymooners and all of those, they still had that dynamic of the 1940s, 1950s kind of family where the man worked and the woman stayed at home, but they never portrayed the women as these trophies that just stayed at home and just you know, were the maids that we had sex with. You know, it was never portrayed like that. It was always just like with the monsters and just like with Adam's family, it was always portrayed as this partnership, this, this dynamic duo that were together supporting each other, you know, helping out where the weak, you know, because in the Adam's family, Morticia had, had strengths that Gomez totally had his weaknesses, but Gomez had strengths that Morticia had his weaknesses. And so it was this great dynamic. They were so together. Yeah, you know, I remember. I remember Morticia. <laughs> I mean, they they they, were, they had this issue about Fester and about was Fester really Gomez's brother, and they were having conflict about it because Morticia was like, he doesn't want to talk to me. He doesn't. He's got this troubling thing, and we can't sort it out. And then what they did was together they went to couple therapy, and had a conversation about it and sorted it out. You know, yeah. as opposed, and I mean. Bearing in mind, this movie came out in the 90s when couples therapy was not as accepted as it is now. Right. <laughs> and then, okay, so then you compare that with Twilight. Yeah. Or a lot of the different things. A lot of the, you know, I, I, I've been poo-pooing on Cruella. 
Look mm-hmm. at, you know, you have the re- relationship between Cruella and Jasper. Yeah. Because that really should have been kind of this romantic relationship. But we know where the movie's going. It's like the Titanic. It, it's going to sink. <laughs> we, we've already seen the 1963 version of the movie where yeah. she treats him like freaking garbage. But with Cruella, we have to watch that. We have to watch them grow up together and and build this not necessarily romantic love, but definitely a brother sister love where he cared about her, you know, and it was, it showed in that scene where he's like, he's like, I got you a job at that one place that you're dying to work at. It's your number one life's goal. I got you a job there. And the other one's like, Oh, so we're going to rob him. And he's like, no, no, that's what she's going to work there. Oh, and then she's, we're going to rob him. And he's like, no, she's going to work there because it's her dream. And so then we're going to rob him. Like, no, it's literally, I'm giving her what she desires. And yet, like I said, the only thing I felt for in that movie was Jasper. And the whole time I'm just like, dude, you need to go and find a shelter because you're being abused. You're an abused partner in this relationship. And I felt so sorry for him that, that he was just this, he loved her with all of his heart and he was a doormat to her. And that just, I, I don't, I don't want to watch that. I don't want to feel, fantasy fulfill that. I mean, again, in the burning bed, it's the same thing, but she lights him on fire. She kills him. <laughs> so if Jasper had killed her at the end, I'd been like, yeah, yeah, that was a great movie. <laughs> Let's talk about what family relationships mean, because this is one of the things that I think is quite often to me, weirdly explored. Well, you mentioned you mentioned Twilight. Let's. I want you to yeah, go back and revisit that. Let's talk about Twilight. So, Twilight to me. Now, I will admit, I have only seen one movie, and I saw it because I was glued in horror to my couch and could not find the remote to switch it off, and I couldn't make my legs work enough to switch the TV off. I'm sorry if you're a fan. I just i I can't even. <laughs> But my problem with Twilight, disregarding the sparkly vampires, I could have gotten past the sparkly vampires. Everyone picks on that. And that's literally. No, no, that's, that's the least of it. Like I, I can, I can get past that. It's okay. I can get past. It. My problem with Twilight is how toxic that relationship. Those relationships. Those relationships. are. So Edward. So he says to her, stay away from me, but then he doesn't stay away from her. He moons over her it, it's like she's going for the thing that tells her i'm bad for you and then she's still going for it and then he is bad for her he wants to put his controlling little vampire paw on her and make her life his that is the definition of a toxic romantic relationship <laughs> yeah and I mean, it it would have had me screaming for the hills. I would never tolerate being in a relationship. Like but she that. did have another option. She had the weird werewolf. <laughs> she had another option. So go down that for a second. Because that's so, that's so much different. You know, so she had this on one side, she's got this really toxic, kind of narcissistic, controlling relationship. But as all good stories are, we have a different side. So so what's that side like? So my problem with the werewolf side of this equation is at first it seems more reasonable, right? Jacob seems more reasonable. And I've gone and I've read the plot subsequently because you can't be a writer and not at least try and understand the Twilight phenomena, right? I went and read all the plot synopsises and stuff. And my problem with Jacob is it starts out more reasonable. It starts out more reasonable. And then he's losing his temper and he's committing violence around her now i have been in situations where people are hitting a wall behind my head you know like a fist going past your ear like that it is the most frightening situation i've ever been in and i would never choose to spend time with those people well i was hoping you were going to go a different direction because i was kind of okay. setting you up <laughs> because jacob also tells her i'm bad for you Yes. And she also still goes after him, just like Edward. He also doesn't stay away from her. And he also, and I, I love the way you said it, and I'll just do it like that. He wants to put his little werewolf paw of control on her and make her his. So yes. you really have these two choices. You have this narcissistic controlling jerk, or you can choose this narcissistic controlling jerk. 
Yes. Like those are your choices in your great relationships. The, the, those are literally your choices. Of of all the men in Bella's life, her name is Bella, right? Yeah. Yeah. Of all the choices in Bella's life, the only one, the only male figure that is of any worth is her father. The, the rest of them are... I, <laughs> How were they even choices? How? Yeah. How? Well, she does eventually get rid of uh, Jacob's affection because um, she gets pregnant, and Jacob's like, "Oh yeah, no, I'm gonna so do that baby." Yeah, like because that's not weird. <laughs> <laughs> to me, to me, the, the, my problem isn't so much that uh, Twilight was playing with toxic relationships. My problem is that Twilight seems to be entirely unaware that it's playing with toxic relationships. Yeah, that, that really is. That's the, the calamity of it. I mean, because... I've never been in a romantic toxic relationship, but but I've had toxic relationships and friendships and 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 things like that and um and family and and so on as i'm you know like people do you you carry some scourge from that stuff yeah but bella's just like oh i'm gonna sit in a flower meadow yeah and and, and that's like i said that's the calamity of it because you could have had this dichotomy this this opposite this this mm-hmm. choosing instead of just trapping in between two bookends that are the exact same. That are both narcissistic. <laughs> That's what we want to do. You know, it, it's entertainment or, or if you're playing with these thematic elements, how you get the audience to understand and consume these thematic elements is, is by, you know, juxtaposition and all of this stuff that that's literally what we're doing is we're creating conflicts because they're opposites and that's where the reader's imagination is going to be stimulated. That's what we want. We want them to be engaged. We want them to be thinking, oh, I would do this, or oh, I would do that. Or, but if if it's two coin, two head, two sides of the same coin, it really that's why, you know, you, you said this when we were talking offline, but it was that's really the way I feel about it. It's like team Jacob or team Edwards. How about team? I'm gonna just be alone team, team, team i'm team, single thanks guys. Yeah, team <laughs> singles bar because there's yeah. got to be someone out there better i promise you there is somebody better than either of those two guys he might yeah. even be human <laughs> yeah and 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 that's the problem going back to the, our last podcast when i really poo-pooed on the ending of star wars and, and lord of the rings yeah. to me it's the same thing here your thematic elements are not about toxicity. They're not about these horrible. She wants the goal is these. We are. It is a yeah, the, romance. The goal is to enter into one of these toxic relationships. That's yeah. the actual goal. I'm like, how am I rooting I, for this? <laughs> it's also why I don't feel like it was a big stretch for Fifty Shades of Grey to take it into bondage porn, yeah. because it was already so close to bondage porn anyway that. You just just add the bondage porn and you've got it. And so Fifty Shades of Grey was birthed. And so some people do, you know, it's a reality. Some people do fantasize about being dominated and being controlled. And some people pay for, for that. But I'm no, just saying that and even 100%, people that- saying, but, but there are safe words. And, so, and I know that she tried to bring it in with that contract and so on, but it would never be like that. You know what I mean? And it wouldn't be like, because he pushed her into that. Frick- he oh, kept, yeah. how, like- Again, it wasn't the choice. Yeah. Well, and this gets way <laughs> anyway. off topic. Uh, <laughs> so we do need to bring it back. But, yeah. but the, the point is, is that closing the loop on the twilight, mm. you have thematic elements that are going for this happy ending, but you only have choices between two toxic relationships. And that doesn't, that's the disconnect that I have with twilight is, and I think a lot of people had that disconnect. Like my wife read the whole series, but the only reason why she had read the whole series is because she was basically coerced into it because she started book one and she's like, this is terrible. I don't, and her friends were like, oh no, 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 I know it's terrible. I know it's better, but (laughs) it gets better. Keep reading. And so she finishes the first book and she goes, that was terrible. Like, why did I read this? Like, I know, I know the first book it's terrible, but the second book. And so she's like, "Uh," she gets halfway through the second one. She's like, this isn't any better. Oh, it does. It does. Just, just, just keep just like, and so like, why can't people do that about my books? Like, why can't people just be like, oh, no, you you have to read it. You have to keep reading. You have to have to keep reading. You have to keep reading Drake. Just keep reading. Just keep reading. Because <laughs> at least mine are good, I think. But yeah, that's that's she read all three books 
and got to the end. It was like, I don't, that, that was terrible. I don't, none of that was good. Yeah. And no. yet her friends were like, yeah, I know it's terrible, wasn't it? I don't, I don't, I, I don't understand it. I don't understand. It's, it's like that weird it, phenomenon of. But to bring it, to bring it back, relationships and what they mean for your characters. So to me, this is important because it's one of the, it's one of my themes in my books is because I'm very curious about the things that shape you as a person the experiences of your parents, the experiences of your um, relationships, your romantic relationships and with your children and with your family and so on. Because I think that these things all shape who you are. And so that's why Louis, my MC, my, one of my main characters and my narrators, he has a very cold, aloof mother who nonetheless loves him. And so they, they have an extremely complicated relationship. But because of this, he has no moral compass. And he has no moral compass because she couldn't give him one because she doesn't have one. But she could at least give him love. right? So, And then his relationship to his daughter is very warm. And his daughter will have a moral compass because he will have learned things in his life that enables him to give her a moral compass, which he could never have gotten. And it's a whole familial chain of relationships and I don't see enough of that I, I sometimes in especially YA is guilty of this they'll give the hero an abusive parent it's normally an abusive father not always but sometimes um, it can be an abusive mother too it really doesn't make a huge difference which one of your parents are abusing you and then the hero will just somehow recover it, they'll just be like fine it, no <laughs> I'm sorry but no, if you suffer abuse and you are under 10 years old, good luck growing up normal. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and, and again, this goes down to the type of writer I am. It's why I write the relationships that I write. So mm -hmm. in Genesis, the two brothers, their parents are that Gomez and Morticia. Now, you don't, they don't get a lot of screen time together. So you don't get that, oh, you said French. Uh, and you know the kissing and the loving yeah. and all that because they're they're separate but but that's also what happens to you know these brothers are basically graduating high school college age I mean that doesn't exist mm -hmm. in this world but they're you know Ardari is 17 um, Malant is 1920 so the when you reach that age you stop spending the majority of your time with your parents so you usually will see them you'll see your mom here or you'll see your dad there and sometimes you'll see them together or whatever but you're passing through the living room on your way to your bedroom or whatever it, it you you're starting to really get that independence and all that and so that's what you see a lot is you see our dairy with his father or our dairy with his mother and you don't get a lot of the 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 couple time uh, because the couple time at that point, the couple wants to spend that away from their children. And so since my narrating char character is the child, they're not going to be privy to some of that stuff. But I still want to make sure that these people were just the the salt of the earth, just the, mm. the, 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 the classic, great 1950s parents that that support each other, support their children, love their children, and also have really driven in these hardcore moral values. And the reason why it was important for me to start the story in their shadow, you know, in the, the home, Milan's already moved away. He's away at magic school learning all that. But I start our dairy at home because I want the readers to get that moment of, oh, this is the family that they came from. This is the, the parentage that they came from. So that as you watch these boys go into these fantastical situation and go against these, you know, horrible, making these horrible decisions or whatever, you can go, I know why they're, they're trying to do this. And I understand because I understand where they came from. And so they're going to want to do this. And it's the reason why, you know, I did the, the things that I, I did with them. The, one of the, my favorite things about book one of that series is, and again, I did write the series to break a lot of tropes. I did one of the, one of my conscious efforts is to attack tropes that I hate. You know, this is my first published work back in 2008. And I really wanted to go after the, the tropes that I hated. That's why they're brothers, because I hated the trope of one brother becomes a hero. So the other brother becomes a villain. 
Mm-hmm. That's just dumb to me. I also hated the the farm boy starts off as an idiot, but at the end of the first book is the best magic user, the best fighter, the best everything. In the first book, neither of them, not, let me start here. Neither of them kill anything. Mm. Not one thing, not one thing. But here's the other thing. Neither of them actually over and both both you feel like have grown and overcome this great thing at the end of, the, of book one but in reality they were victims being drug along kicking and screaming without wanting to be a part of this for mm-hmm. both of them and i i love that and 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 you know that's where multiple povs lets me cheat because you have the other characters who are basically killing machines that are slaughtering everything <laughs> so there's tons of violence and tons of action and but but you know the main and the brothers are actually the main characters of the of the mm-hmm. five stories so they are the thrust of the story but i love that that i you know kept them out of all of that matter of fact you know when they as in in very early on the younger brother actually sees someone die and it affects him. He's like, oh my God, I can't believe. And chapters later, he's like, I saw someone die. Like, cause that's a hard thing for a 17 year old who's never seen death before. And I, and I forced him to, to face it. Cause he, not only does he see the man die, he's forced to go to that man's funeral and look at his body. And so you're in this, you, you, you're in this growth moment of him coming to terms with this stuff. And why is that important to me? Because he's about to go on a quest where he sees and does tons of horrific things. Mm. And so this base and watching him take this first baby step is very important to me because, you know, that's another trope that I, I hate that you can have this farm boy who's never heard a fly who all of a sudden is just, Hey, we killed something that has a mom. That was awesome. Let's eat lunch. And maybe after lunch, we can kill something else that has a mom. Yay. Like, no, no. Take, if you're a hero, if you're somebody who is trying to do the morally correct thing, taking a life will haunt you for the rest of your existence. It is not something that happens. If you're a psychopath that just kills because you love it, then yeah, that's the type of person you are. But that's usually what a lot of characters are. They're, you know, they're the John Wicks. They're just like, I'm an assassin. I kill people. I don't care about you. I deliberately didn't want to write a coming of age story. I mean, as we've you know discussed. So, so my right. character is a mature 26 year old man who is an assassin he absolutely is the john wick style of character or as one reviewer described him as the james bond of his world but he nonetheless finds a limit right Right. a limit that that he can't cross and that comes from his relationships and i i so I, i i so dislike it when People who are completely alone and without relationships somehow have these amazing codes of honor that come that come from where? Right. Where? Because you don't just you're not born. You do not spring from the womb with, you know, the code of Bushido imprinted on your mind, the perfect samurai character. You don't suffer like Kurt Russell level of, I don't know if you ever saw Soldier. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Kurt Russell in that movie, right? That whole like training period as a child, when he comes out of it, he is willing to kill children. He's got no problems with it. And that's what happens when you take a child and you put them through that kind of training and you desensitize them to that point. That's what you end up with. It's why the gangs in America try to get kids between eight and 11 years old to join the gang. It's not like they're, you know, strong and, and it's because they have learned. It's why people in Africa kidnap children for child soldiers. That's, that's where child, it's literally where they come from. It's, it's because they've learned that you can train them and then make them into these horrific human beings because they don't know any better. If you abuse a child at such a young age, if you turn them into that, that is what will happen. Yeah. And then you read these fantasy authors where it's like, oh, and this terrible thing happened to this child. And they're just, they're fine. Uh, uh, what? Not, and they're not just fine. They're <laughs> actually heroic, morally grounded individuals. Yeah. Where? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, and this is this is why relationships are so important and not just romantic relationship but it's why i i show yeah. their parents at the beginning so that you understand it's it's why because one of the other characters 
is is it starts the same way she has no moral compass because mm. she was literally raised by a psychopath she was raised to be a killing machine and mm. i love her journey because her journey is about getting a moral compass and understanding what it's like and she's even though she eventually ends up on the hero side there's still tons of moments where she she could just kill them and not feel bad about it and not even realize that she's doing it. And so I love I love playing with those thematic tropes. That's why one of the best redemption arcs to me is the redemption arc in Once Upon a Time of the Queen Regina, the evil Queen Regina. In season one, you're introduced to, uh, she's adopted a son. And that boy, her relationship with that boy, he, he wants her to be better. She wants to be a better person for her son, for her adopted son. He's not even son, he's not even her blood son. He's just her adopted son, right? And I say just, but honestly, like just in this case means not her blood son, because I think that adoption is an amazing thing. Mm-hmm. But regardless, and not all families are about blood. But regardless, right. so so she she adopts this boy and she wants to be a better person for him. And that relationship slowly redeems her as a character. But throughout the next six seasons, don't watch season seven, it's terrible. But throughout the six seasons, there are times when she slips. There are times when she kind of, you know, falls off the wagon of being a heroic character and goes back to being the evil queen because that happens. You know, Um, and they also explore her backstory. And she is the way she is because of the way that her mother abused her. So it's just it's a such a great story for building on those family ties and how family ties matter. And you can do a lot with them. I mean, one of my favorite moments with the lion dude in Genesis is when he first gets his freedom, he's not really allowed to be free because he doesn't understand he's, he's been a property. He's been a a tool his whole life. And there's two things. First of all, he's very mature Mm -hmm. because he's literally been used for years as a fighting. He has Mm -hmm. to fight to live as his job. He will die if he does not succeed. And so he's been well-trained. They've spent a lot of money on him. He's very intelligent. But emotionally, he's absolutely stunted. So there's this beautiful scene that I absolutely adore. And it's with a tertiary character. She's not even so she's only in the scene and you never see her again because his life moves on. Mm -hmm. But when he's kind of in this semi lockdown of we're going to, you know, this this benefactor is like, I'm going to this is horrible. I'm going to do this thing for you. Mm -hmm. But you can't You, you have to stay. And so there's this beautiful scene with him and this four year old girl you realize after following him through this horrible stuff that he's going through and he's just this adult killing machine in this moment, the audience gets to go, Oh my God, he's actually probably emotionally about four years of age. And that's why I did it. I Mm -hmm. did it to show you the, the contrast and compare between this brutal killing machine and the fact that he's lived in a cage his entire life. He's, he is an animal on the outside, but he's completely sentient on the inside. And so it's just like locking a human up and treating them like a, a dog, mm-hmm. like an actual dog, not, not, the, yeah. not the, the, the literal word. It literally is this beautiful moment where the audience gets to go, oh my goodness, I really understand this character now and it's Mm -hmm. it's this moment between a four-year-old child and they just they're they're playing a game that's all they're doing Mm -hmm. and and it's a short scene and it's just this little brief moment in his life but it's literally the first baby step to allowing him to understand and to grow and to start getting it and then the crazy thing is that that his the rest of his story and really where his growth really comes from is his relationship with a 10 year old boy. So he leaves there and he ends up being a bodyguard and, and his, he's supposed to be protecting this child, but they fall in love with each other. You know, they have this beautiful relationship. They're willing to die for each other. It's, it's a wonderful relationship. And, you know, every time somebody will take that to the wrong, they will be like, Oh, he loves a 10 year old boy. Yeah. And I'm like, no, sometimes it's not about that. <laughs> it, 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 most of the times it's not most about of the that. time. It's not about that. So, but it's it you get to watch him through the rest of the book 
mature emotionally with this child, this 10 year old that he's mm. literally growing. Cause he doesn't understand this stuff. He doesn't understand freedom and self-reliance and choice. And, you know, all of this stuff is so foreign to him. And if it isn't for his relationship with this child, you just don't get to see that growth. You don't get to see it. So that relationship is so, and, and, and the boy is literally the only thing he's ever loved in his life. The first thing he's ever loved in his life. And, you know, up to that point, the only thing that he's ever loved in his life, uh, he never even loved himself. Mm -hmm. And so it's this very important moment, this very, you know, huge growth moment. But again, it comes from relationships, you know, building these relationships, making us understand these relationships. If you don't do that, and, 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 and it's the same thing in romance. Again, I don't buy Bella pining over these, these horrible relationships that she wants to get into. I, I, don't, I don't understand why anybody would want those relationships. They are, they're horrifying. <laughs> yeah. When I write romance, and, and I do write romance mm -hmm. in my fantasy, there's, there's love stories in everything that I write, but I also, as some of you know, write romance under a female name that I've never told anybody. So, and I haven't written anything in five, six years now in that. And I do have two novels that are in the works that, have, that I just haven't had time to go back to. So eventually I'll get back to it and she will start republishing books again. Cause I write as a female author. I write female main characters, you know, it's all that, yeah. but even in that, it's still about building the relationships. I still have to build where the character came from so that the audience understands why they make the decisions they make. Mm -hmm. They, if they're broken, they're going to, you know, I'm going to, it's always about transformation. So they're going to transform into being more fixed. If they're fixed, they're going to be transformed and be more broken. And so all of these things are derived from the relationships okay. that they have either romantic relationship from, you know, familial relationships or just friendship relationships mm -hmm. or acquaintance relationships or villain relationships. Like one of my favorite uh, and I know you have something to say, but I, I just thought mm -hmm. of something that, that it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliantly written relationship. And that's in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So when we meet Spike, he is the villain. Yes. I am going to kill him. I will do everything in my power to kill him. Oh, he stopped me. Oh, he thwarted me. Oh, he's he's such a. And then in like season six, she ends up having sex with him. <laughs> because he's the only thing she can relate to at that point. Mm -hmm. She has, he has basically taught her things through their conflict and through their fight. And at the end of it, she realizes that, that they're the same and they end up boning because of it. And so, but you, but you get it, you understand, yeah. and it is a toxic relationship, but you absolutely, and, and, and she's not pining to be in it. She hates herself for being in it. Yeah. She hates herself afterwards. She, and I mean, Spike's only in it because he's got this chip in his head, right? Uh, that's, it. that's the point where he's got a chip in his head. I don't remember. It's too long ago since I've seen it's been it. ages, but I mean, it's, yeah. it's brutal. Like it's not a fun, it's not a happy fun time relationship. <laughs> Right, right. It's a toxic relationship that has toxic, toxic. outcomes. Yeah. And so we get that. It's not a little girl going, oh my God, wouldn't it be so amazing if I was no. totally dominated and had no choice of my own and you know, was this guy's trophy? That would that's the type of life I want to live. And to me, that's where you're insulting to the yeah. female side of the equation. So there is one thing that I, I think that we should talk about briefly, and that is that. There are some things that I think that one doesn't, one doesn't recover from. And sometimes I think that fantasy authors have got a tendency to go like, oh, no, you'll recover. But I have met guys who were in special forces in the military. They were grown adult, well, I mean, 18-year-old, but they were adult men when they went through that training. And that training still left pretty permanent scars on that. They're not normal people. Now you take that and you're, you're telling me you're going to take a child and put them through that kind of training and turn them into a soldier. And then you're going to, you're going to fix them. Like I, I enjoyed soldier. I enjoyed Kurt Russell soldier. Right. And he is more healed at the end of it. Mm -hmm. But if they did a sequel where he has a grounded moral compass, I wouldn't buy it. No. Because he's still in the growth box. Yeah. I'll, I'll take you a step further. Black Widow. 
Now, a lot of people didn't like the movie because of how slow it was, Mm -hmm. but all of that slowness was just jam packed with character relationship building. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. I loved every minute of that. Like a lot of, a lot of people that I've talked to are like, oh my God, the movie is so slow. I don't understand. Why would you like that? It's so slow because every bit of it makes me want to care about her and her journey and understand why she's the person she is and how she came out of being a child assassin Mm -hmm. to being this person who actually wants to save the world. It's totally believable. It's totally viable. And, and I think they did a fantastic job with it. And it it literally is. And, and the fact that they used the fake family, because that's what, and, and, and Mm. have you seen the Black Widow. I, I've I've seen enough of it too. It's it's not a spoiler, so you can go for it. In the beginning, the spoiler is is that you don't you think it's her dad and her mom and yeah, her little and sister. Yeah, it's actually a fake. It's a fake family. Yeah, and you find out that he's just a Russian spy. She's just a Russian yeah. spy, and the kids were actually kidnapped as children and just thrown into this mm. um, because they were arm candy. Just it's mm. a family, and we need two children. And so years later in the movie everybody gets back together in this kind of weird organic fashion. And so you, you have them, they, they did a great job. I love callbacks and it's, it's harder to do in movies in my opinion, but if you pay attention to the opening scene, when the family sits down to dinner and it's the two little girls, they're like five and nine or something like that. And then the parents, um, and then flash forward to the same scene where, where they sit down for dinner again, they are sitting in the exact same spots in the exact same you know, locations, looking at the exact same things. It was this beautifully done. These two scenes are identical. This is when they were five and nine. This is when they're 25 and 30 or 25 and 29, whatever. And so I I really love the cinematography of that, that it was this beautiful tie-in. And I I bet you know, almost nobody even notices it. I just, I'm very, I'm very (laughs) aware of of when you do stuff like that. It's, to me, it's brilliant. It's a great connecting of the two images but now they know it's all fake they the two girls know they're not sisters the the they know that the parents are not their parents and that they're not even married that you know everything was fake Mm -hmm. and so it's this wonderful scene with all this tension and all of this you know this anger and this you know you were lied to and and all this stuff and then watching them become a family like i won't ruin it but the line you know, the younger sister has this big thing mm-hmm. and watching the black widow character get to the point where she agrees. She's like, yes, I agree with this thing that you've been pushing. It's, it's brilliant and it's beautifully done. And it's this great family relationship between the three of them. I mean, between the four of them and they walk out of there almost, you're almost like, wow, they're an actual family. At the end of this. Like dad and mom and two daughters. And like, it was a, it was a great, but it's slow. And the reason why it's slow is you have to take the time to develop that. If you're going to make the audience believe that stuff, you've got to develop that relationship. And unfortunately, a lot of those relationship development uh, processes are, are slow. Uh, one of my favorite lines that, that goes with this, but on the opposite side is in the movie Speed. And you have Sandra Bullock and, and um, Keanu Reeves characters meet each other in this high intense situation. And there's a lot of sexual tension between them. And I can't remember which character says it, but one of them toward the end of the movie says, you know, like 90% of all relationships that are formed during a high stress in- environment end up failing. So like they even admit that they have not developed their relationship. They have not, they literally just saved each other's lives and we're in this terrifying situation. And that's their only connection. They have no depth. They have no, they don't know each other or anything like that. And so I love the fact that they, they actually dropped the line in that they were like, this relationship is, I know you guys are rooting for these two to get together audience, but it's not going to work. They know nothing about each other. They have no idea if they're even compatible. I mean, Keanu Reeves' character could be gay for all we know. I know this is what you're rooting for, audience, but I'm going to tell you, you know, just as a little line here to to not get your hopes up too much. Probably not going to (laughs) work. So I love that. I love that they did that. I love that that even in a movie where you can't take any time to develop the relationship, they actually said, I know you guys are hoping for this, but look at the reality. And I love that. I love that they did that. 
for me, key takeaway from, from this relationship discussion is take your time, build up the relationships. Make it believable. Make it believable. Consider what theme you're playing with. If toxic relationships and escaping them had been Twilight's theme, it would have been an amazing movie. It would honest. have worked. I, I, I'm not going to go with amazing movie. It would have worked better. It would have worked better. Okay. It would have worked better. So I don't usually pick on IPs. Um, I try not to, and I don't like. Twilight's I big enough that you can pick on them. They, well, they I don't, don't, what I don't like are the guys, <laughs> the, the guys like on YouTube that have the shows yeah. that literally have made their living making fun of other people's, you know, yeah. intellectual yeah. property. What have you created? Like, like you get to pick on them, but what have you created? You've created nothing but a show that picks on other people's stuff that they tried to do a good job with. They are really funny too at the same time. So I have this weird relationship with them that, that I hate you with every fiber of my being, but keep making it because it's very entertaining. And I laugh a lot watching you that I hate with every fiber of my being. <laughs> it's a really weird relationship. But there's one guy that actually he does these movie pitches where he plays both parts, but he plays the writer who's yes. pitching the movie and the super the easy, producer. barely an inconvenience, right? Super easy, <laughs> barely an inconvenience. The one he did on Twilight is so funny. Amazing. It's like, okay, but why is she doing this? Well, because she's the main character. Oh, right. Wait, why are these people deferring to her? Well, because she's the main character. Oh, right. <laughs> Why does she succeed at this? Because it doesn't seem like she has the ability. Because well, the movie must happen. Oh, right, 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 right. I keep forgetting that. Like, because I'm going to literally... need you to get all the way off my back about that. <laughs> I need you to get all the way off my back. Yeah. So, yeah. like I said, I hate him because he doesn't create anything himself. <laughs> I would argue that those, and, and actually he's got some skits where he does his own skits um, on oh, YouTube. I haven't seen those because I don't um, watch them normally. So, so they're, they're amazingly funny actually, because he does these skits. He is amazingly like funny. The first, the first man to eat breakfast, the first mm. man to take a shower, the first man to throw a punch. <laughs> I am now going to have to go do a little bit more research. Well, Maybe I'll stop hating him with every fiber of my being. Well worth it. He does really great little skits. Um, and, and I would argue that his pitch meetings are different from most satire meetings because most, as you say, they just pick on it like nee, 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 nee. they're not even reviewing. Right. 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 But his pitch meetings make relevant points about the content. Well, and I think that's, you know, it's, it's like a review with a humor twist. <laughs> right. And, and, and it's the same way I feel about because you could say, well, wait a minute, in the last podcast, you just went hard against the ending of both Lord of the Rings and, and Star Wars. Yeah. Yes. However, I also give you solutions, reasons, things yeah. to think about why the code is the way it is. It's a much more in-depth actual discussion it's of using it more as a cautionary tale yeah. to, what, to, to learn to be a better storyteller yourself. Yeah. And that's why I always you know, it always feels stupid to say, Hey, look, you need to learn to be a better storyteller than, than star than George Lucas and star Wars, the guy who's made more money than you will ever make in your life. You need to be a better, right? Like it's, it sounds so stupid to say that, but that's because most of the industry only puts the success of a story on how much money it makes. Mm. And I don't, I do not put the success of a story on how much money it makes. I put the success of a story on how much it impacts the audience uh, and actually tries to make them a better human being. The 50, That's shades, where the of gray, comes from. 50 shades of Grey made billions of dollars. Yeah. It's still an absolutely atrocious story that I would never recommend anybody reading yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's that. But I also know millions of people bought that book and never finished it. I, one of the things I always said is I'd love to, to make a, write a story that offends Christianity so much that they unite and buy just millions of copies of the book to publicly burn it. Like that would be my career made overnight <laughs> because not only would I get the, the millions of sales of books that you're burning, but it would make the rest of the world go, why is this book so bad that, that they're burning it by the millions? I'm going to go buy a copy. So you would double that millions, millions and millions of sales by the people that would want to check it out. And, and so I've always said that, but the truth of the matter is, is I don't want people buying my books just to burn it. Yeah. I, I, that to me, selling the book is not my goal. 
skeptical. impacting the reader, making them feel something, making them contemplate life and humanity and, and the world that, that is around them. That's my goal. And so if, if I sell, you know, 50,000 copies of a book that makes 50,000 people really feel like they should try to be better human beings, to me, that is way more successful than selling 5 million copies of a book. Now I'd like to do both. I'd like yes. to sell 5 million copies and have 5 million people, you know, impacted by it. <laughs> but, you know, that's really how I, I see success. It's always my success comes from my fans coming up and going, wow, man, like that really impacted me. I really, I loved what you did here. And I, I really made me feel this, or it made me feel that. And that's where I take my success out of. And that is, I think, especially, it's especially impactful when you experience that through relationships that mm -hmm. are believable, deep, meaningful, and carry the story. Everything, in my opinion, is, is going to come out of those relationships, the, the relationships that they have in the past, the relationships that they have during the story. Those are the things that impact them. Those are the things that grow them. Those are the things that change them. Sure, events also do it. You know, they get their hand chopped off. That changes them as a character. But it's still, you know, that's only one piece of a very large puzzle. And a lot of the other pieces come from their past relationships and their, their current relationships. And on that note, we will see you soon for another episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon. Thanks for joining us.